Welcome to our webinar. This webinar is part of the online training program Medine on Air. It's co-founded by Erasmus Plus and produced by six partners from the Mediterranean region, from France, Italy, Malta, Portugal, Slovenia, and Turkey. Medine on Air aims to provide specific preparation for classical musicians and improvisers to enrich young musicians' musical training with 38 live interactive webinars led by the renowned artists and high qualified pedagogues. They are free and open to all upon registration. So I start my presentation. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, I am introduce myself. Hi to all. Um, I am Shizun Özgün. Uh, I am an ethnomusicologist and I teach ethnomusicology in Istanbul Technical University Center for Advanced Studies in Music, MIAM. Also, I am the vice director of MIAM and I mostly work on political soundscapes, genre and music and Yuruk sound world. Uh, Yuruk culture is the one that we are going to talk mostly in this webinar. And Michael is with me here, my colleague and my teacher. He used to be teaching in Miam when I was a student here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him with me in the seminar. So could you please introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm Michael Ellison. I'm a composer. And um, as Shireen refers to, I, I taught at Miam from 2002 to 2010. We still work extensively together on many projects. And um, I'm teaching at uh, University of Bristol now. And um, happy to be here. Thank you, Michael. I want to start with what we understand when we say Mediterranean. What are its characteristics and historical and cultural significances? So uh, when we talk about traditional musics, traditional cultures in the Mediterranean coast, what do we mean? What is Mediterranean and uh, what are these traditions in, is, uh, are limited with? So uh, to be able to do that, I draw on the ideas of French historian Fernand Brodel. But you can see first in this map that uh, I am in Istanbul and uh, Miami is located in Istanbul. And the area that we are going to talk about is this area in the south, west Anatolia, and you can see that the Anatolian Peninsula is in the middle of a complex of uh, seas connected to, to each other. And also it's a part of a bigger uh, complex, geographical complex that we call Mediterranean. So Parnam uh, says that the Mediterranean is a complex system, not only consisting of interconnected seas, but also of mountain systems, plains and human mobility. The geographical conditions had a tremendous effect on how cultures and human mobility evolved and developed. For Brodel, the change in this region is constant, full of conflicts, but also happening in very long periods of time that he calls the long durée. Still, we can see that he was right when talking about the long durée because there were cyclic changes all over this Mediterranean world uh, happening. And we can see the results now in many ways. The Anatolian coast, the mountainous region uh, behind that, and the inner plateaus of Anatolia are full of diverse cultures, both settled and unsettled. And we can just mainly uh, name a few uh, of these cultures, but these are not just all. There are lots more uh, in Anatolia. Greek, Armenian, Jewish, Arab, and Turkish cultures uh, are present al along with other cultures too. This diversity is ethnic, religious, and linguistic at once. And in this diverse context, the mobility of nomads has been an important cultural and economic factor. Also, we have to admit that the demographic changes, especially since the First World War, had a drastic effect on this diversity, especially with the movement of Greek population. Uh, to Greece, among others. 
So the Turkish population, uh, especially in the Mediterranean coast, is comprised both of both settled and nomadic people. Among them, Yuruks are the nomads who live in many parts of Turkey. So what is Yuruk? The widely accepted and well-known meaning of the word Yuruk represents the people who earn their lives by stock breeding and maintain an unsettled life in Anatolia. The Dictionary of Turkish Language Foundation states following main meanings of the word Yuruk. The first one is nomad, göçebe in Turkish, and the second one, çok yürüyen, person who walks much. Walks much. So, you can see that the definition is more of a practical one rather than ethnic. But in Turkey, there is a common understanding that Yuruks all over Anatolia are part of the same and identical culture. Contrary to that belief, we see that there is also a diversity among different Yuruk identities and cultural practices. Nomadism well, has been one of the oldest ways of life in Anatolian Mediterranean coast. Nomads are animal herders and they move from the mountain to the coast and vice versa according to the seasonal changes. This way of life is dep dependent on the needs of the animals that they have. This movement traditionally follows specific routes and each Europe group have their special places to stay both on the coast and on the mountain plateaus. Consequently, this mobile way of life created specific musical instruments which are light and small enough to be carried along on the migration periods or when herding the animals. In these conditions of cyclic mobility, human bodies also become part of the musical culture and human voice becomes more than a voice, but a bodily instrument to be played. We also need to say that parallel with Roda's understanding of what Mediterranean is, the land behind the Taurus mountains, which lay parallel to the sea, is culturally and musically connected to the mountains and to the coast. Like everywhere else in the whole region, here, nomads and settled people were and still are constantly negotiating the rights on resources and places. Nomads are and were also subject to state regulations, which mostly resulted with settlement. Since the Ottoman times, there have been a systematic policy on settling nomads uh, and integrating them into the system, mostly in order to control them within a legal framework. So, in the rest of the presentation, we will talk about the musical characteristics of Yuruks in Teke Peninsula that I have uh, marked here, this part of Southern Anatolia, uh, which itself represents a distinct cultural milieu. I have been doing fieldwork in this region and Michael did the fieldwork there too. Uh, so I will start by introducing some musical instruments and Michael will continue with his experience as a researcher and composer within this musical culture. The video excerpts that you will see are recording during the future I have conducted as a MIAM project with a team of students researchers between 2018 and 2020. The first one is Jura. It's a um, three-string balama. And it's a very small instrument. Its size made it possible to be carried throughout the migration and by the shepherds. Let's listen to the sound of it. Nowadays, uh, since the migration is not practiced anymore, musicians with a nostalgia on these pastimes reproduce the feeling of moving on the mountains by the use of reverberations, as we hear 
in the video. All over the Mediterranean, uh, we see some goddess figurines who are holding a drum. And this goddess is often called Kibere or Sibere. So uh, we see also that in Anatolia, the traditional musical practices related to fertility and women's rights of rites of passages are mostly held in women-only environments. And the frame drum is one of the most important figures uh, in these rites. Now we are going to listen to frame drum playing women. <laughs> is a henna song and it is sang in uh, henna rituals which are done before the uh, bride goes to the to her new new home with her husband new home so kibele the goddess kibele has been associated with fertility motherhood nature and as always holding the drum as you can see in the picture it's it's a uh, it's a photo uh, from Berlin Pergamon Museum, uh, and it is uh, found in periods uh, from Greece, but you can find most of similar uh, um, figurines, figures, uh, statues all around Anatolia and uh, all around Mediterranean, especially. So uh, it's very likely that the drum as a women's instrument today is a remnant of that ancient beliefs. Another one, throat playing, is a practice where the body becomes an instrument. It was a practice of young girls herding the animals alone on the top of the mountains. It's also thought to be a game among girls or a flirting practice among youngsters. <laughs> So, uh, most women who perform the throat playing are elder now and they feel it difficult to do since they say they quit the practice once they are married. And there are two sides in this practice in terms of gender relations. On the one hand, women do not have the access to the other instruments except from drums. So this might be considered as one of the limited ways of their musical expressions. But on the other hand, you can see that the other instruments seem to imitate musically the throat playing. So the unanswered question is, do women imitate the instruments or the instrument players imitate their throat playing? Uh, the other instrument is kemane. Let's quickly listen to it because Michael will talk about it in more details. <laughs> Yes. 
Hepsi, I just mentioned Hepsi here. Don't go in details. It's a wind instrument. It's a very small but very strong uh, instrument that Michael will talk in much more detail because he has some experiences with that. But uh, I just wanted to hear its sound on the Sholan field, uh, which is a feast organized by each Europe tribe in, uh, during the summer on one of the plateaus. Different families and groups belonging to the same tribe come together for these events and spend the whole day producing the old habits in the tents, dancing to the sounds of traditional popular music and socializing. Here you can hear the sounds of Sipsi echoing on the mountains. <laughs> Stop sharing. Michael? Great, just need to unmute. Thanks so much, Shirin. Um, so, Deva Medilim, let's continue. And um, I'll be giving this from a composer's point of view more. And um, I'm just going to tell you first a little bit about my background in Turkish music in general uh, to contextualize where I'm coming from as a composer here. So I first came to Turkey in 1997, believe it or not, and um, was fortunate enough to meet Isan Hoja, who we just heard in the last presentation, these amazing toxins. And I spent a lot of the year learning Turkish, and um, I've been bouncing back and forth ever since I first uh, learned about Turkish music, which is, was even before this, um, between the classical makam music and a love of the, the folk music from around Anatolia. So in 2000 and 2001, I did my first project out in the field, uh, traveling around the Karadeniz Black Sea region, um, and also other places, including Burdur and Fethiye in the uh, Teke region, which was very useful, or would become very useful later. And um, I won't go into detail on these other things, but central to my sort of mission as a composer has been a trilogy of music theater pieces or chamber operas, uh, the first was in 2012. Uh, it's called Say I Am You Mevlana. And this used both Makam classical instruments and uh, Hezarfan Ensemble, which is a Western instrument contemporary ensemble I'd formed along with Ulrich Merten in 2010. And um, then Deniz Kustu, which Neva played in, in 2016. And this is... Um, based on the text of Yashar Kemal, who's an important, one of the most important novelists in Turkey, uh, who passed away a few years ago. And since 2015, I've been working on an ERC project, which is able to consolidate all the research which goes into these kinds of things, and um, to actually sit down with musicians and explore some of the challenges of working together transculturally and transtraditionally. So that's been really exciting and it's happened almost exclusively at MIAM. Um, so thank you, Shirin and Yelda, for that. Uh, a book will be coming out of this on the instruments, which you'll see some of the accompanying videos for as we go on. Um, so the third total music theater piece is called Binbo Alarev Sanisi, Where To? And um, Binbo Alarev Sanisi means a legend of a thousand bulls. The text is also from a novel by Yashar Kemal, and it's about the end of nomadism in Turkey. Um, 
So as Shirin well described, there were efforts going way back to Ottoman times, and there's a lot of poetry about the resistance of the nomadic tribes against the state who are trying to pin them down and take them down from the mountains and so on, and the nomads resist that. <clears throat> so it was quite an inspiring subject for Yashar Kemal, who's from eastern Anatolia. And um, this is a thread that connects the Bozlak region, which you see below the uh, forces I'll be using in this opera, let's call it, um, along with Sipsi, which you just heard, Jura, Balama, and Kemane, and Kaval. So this will be mixed with uh, Western instruments in Binbolar Evsanesi coming up. So my starting place for this was actually Bozlak, and um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I wanted to talk first about how my perspective has changed throughout these years. Um, I'm not sure I had any perspective when I first came to Turkey. I was just open to uh, most of what I was hearing, and I knew I loved the music um, or many different types of music that I, I was hearing. But as I go on in these trans traditional projects, I think what's more and more important is the collaboration and the level of collaboration going up, up, up. And this includes with performers and musicians, which has always been important to me, even if I was a composer writing for a violin player. It's also extremely important, but doubly or triply so um, when I'm reaching across what began as a divide, let's say, with um, someone from the Teke region or playing Makam music. So. And it's to the point where I'm really interested in, in really thinking of it as a co-creation. Um, so there's a kind of balancing act going on here because in tech, contemporary music, we tend to write really detailed notation all the time. And this is what Western performers want, but someone like Neva or in, well, Neva can do anything almost, but um, a more average uh, Makam player will tend to improvise all the ornaments like Yelda mentioned in the last talk. So I've, I've learned less can be more, and I'm really emphasizing that in the new piece with folk musicians. Um, so there's a balancing act going on for me, and I think whenever a composer or someone from outside, let's say, um, comes in, it's, it's trying to keep some semblance of a compositional voice and to lead the project, lead the piece, um, but at the same time, allow it to be influenced substantially by the musicians. And these workshops have been a godsend, and we'll see a little bit of them in a second. Um, I'm also more and more emphasizing the need to be specific about what I'm studying. So these are two minority cultures in um, Kershahir and in the Teke region, and they're not even known as being a region in themselves in Turkey. They're, they're so particular. Uh, but for me, the excitement about the music and the cultures is driving me forward for this piece. Um, so trans-traditional in the end, Nedemek, what does it mean? Uh, for me, it means all these things. And I, I'm really not, uh, in contrast to um, some others I've talked to around it and music festivals, I'm not really interested in the mosaic idea of putting musicians from many different cultures together. I mean, I have done a couple of projects like that, and it's nice, it's really fun. But um, I'm much more interested in, perhaps it has to do with my immersion in Makam music, at really going deeper into more than one type of tradition. And so for me, that's the essence. And the, the really most basic definition is simply um, having musicians from different traditions, of course. Um, but I'd like to not just let everyone uh, be themselves, but also dare to reach out across the other, <laughs> to the other side and learn about the music that the other performer on the next to them or across the room is bringing and what I'm bringing as a composer. And I find that we share a lot of tastes. So for example, when we talk with the musicians in the opera about, oh, what a great player this is who I'm about to play for you. Um, and there are also so many levels of interculturality, not only East and West, that's why, why my project is called Beyond East and West, but say within Turkey, 
itself. So I'm embracing non-reductiveness, let's say. <laughs> Sorry, my screen doesn't want to go. OK, so what is Bose lock? Um, it's especially concerned for me. It's an obsession with the voice, and it's usually accompanied by a balama over a drone like um, substrata. So here's an example from one of the late, ninth, or late 20th century masters, Chekich Ali from Kershi here. Doar Yaz which is the spring months awaken. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm on the Zoom, not the PowerPoint, really. <laughs> Just bear with me for a second. There we go. So you hear in the Bose lock, the, it starts very high. It's one of these energy <laughs> macong like uh, structures where the singer starts very high and plummets down, and it takes the entire verse for this to happen. And um, it's also very free, like the toxim, in terms of rhythm. So we hear rhythmic things inside, but it's quite flexible with the, the tempo and unmetered. So how does this link to the Teke region? As we move westward across or along the south uh, Mediterranean coast of Turkey, the Taurus Mountains link these regions. And um, also the past and present of nomadism link these cultures. So the Kirshahir Abdals are peripatetic and previously nomadic. And in the Teke region, we have pastoralists and animal herders who are also called Yuruk. They're also Yuruk further east in, in Turkey. And one of the other commonalities besides migration between the two is that they both claim lineages back to Central Asia and as a kind of Öz Turkishness, uh, like Yelda. <laughs> so a kind of uh, very deep-seated um, cultural heritage going back a long way. Um, so again, the Teke region is not even a whole South Central Anatolia region, but within that, um, and the specificness is very important to me. So the research I did back in 2000 was really, really helpful um, and is being helpful in writing this piece, as we'll get to. Um, and it's also helpful that Shirin has talked about the throat airs or boaz havala. So women do this by pressing their throat, actually, to get pitches above. And Shirin asked the question, is it the instruments that influence the voices and, or vice versa? And I've been told that it's the women's voices that influence the instruments. I'm just going to assume that because vocal music generally comes first. Of course, it could be the goats jumping as well, which we, we've talked about, uh, or the gesture of that. But it's a very striking and very peculiar or particular regional style in the Teke region, 
that has to do with this. So all the instruments imitate it. And I'd like to play Ferhat Erdem, our Sipsi player, who's from that region, but also has a position playing in TRT in Ankara. So this is called Yaya, Yaila Yolara, Road to the Highlands, a Gurchhavasa or migration song. Now, uh, Ferhat was good enough to show, I don't know if you hear where he's going like this, figuratively speaking, uh, but all he has to do on Sipsi is lift his first finger way at the top, and um, he's making these yodel-like motions up. So he demonstrated for us and slowed it down in this example. So moving on to Jura or Uchtele Balama, three string Balama, um, and Ramazan Gungar, the uh, really great musician uh, who I did field work with in 2000. Um, basically, there's a technique called finger tapping or Parmakvurma, which is, has become very widespread and all the Balama players in Turkey do it, but it originated from this region and with a player like Ramazan Gungur as being one of the prime uh, proponents of that. And I'm going to play now Erdem Shimshek, who's also at Itu, a younger player who's studied this and other Balama traditions. And he'll be playing a Boaz Hava, which is the throat air on an instrument. Sorry to cut that off. So uh, you saw three techniques basically right there. Um, one was the tapping, which is usually at the fifth above the tonic, which is very similar to what the Sipsi was doing. Um, and with nowadays players will move all over the place, of course. Uh, and he was also using after the strumming, which is part of the Sherpe technique or Pencheli technique, um, a one finger plucking approach, which directly comes from Ramazan Gungur. Uh, on Kemane, we can see similar things. So this is Ur Unur uh, in our Miam studio again, and playing a Boaz Haba. And you'll see to do the leaps here, he needs to swivel his entire instrument.
So now getting back to my own compositions with this, uh, we have actually all three of those players in the background there and me wearing the same shirt uh, <laughs> conducting this. And um, in this excerpt, we're playing one of the more Eastern Mediterranean examples, let's call it, more Kirschy here sounding from a Boslak mode and Erdem and Ur on Balama and Kemane, I'm sure you agree, are doing just fine. Okay, I should mention that I'd probably written this two days before, and this is a first rehearsal. So if it's not perfection, uh, it, it will be better in the performance. Um, but I'm asking Erdem, especially on Balama, to do all kinds of things he's not used to here, but he's navigating well. Um, unfortunately for me, with Sipsi, and um, it's fun to share something like this, there was a section I called Beats. Uh, based on teke music. And you see Ferhat on the left sitting there without an instrument even because he's given up <laughs> trying to play. He, he gets occasional uh, pointers from the musicians, other musicians about how he might approach it. So, yeah, he doesn't look that happy. And um, so what did I do wrong? <laughs> Ur and uh, Erdem, the other two players, were saying, oh, he can do it, don't worry. But I realized uh, that wasn't entirely true. And um, I was partly blamed. So what was the problem? <laughs> um, I did use 9.16, uh, but I'd reversed it and mixed it up and changed meters in between. So sometimes it would go straight instead of ok sok meaning uh, additive meters. And I did use lots of leaps, as you hear, uh, but basically what you just heard was missing the melody part in the Sipsi. Um, what I did, however, that, yeah, so I reversed the rhythm and that made it more tricky. I used a high G sharp prominently above A as the tonic, um, where he was supposed to leap from A to G sharp. Um, which I hadn't seen in a Turku or a Sipsi piece before. And later I would realize why. And especially, and it sounds like the most obvious thing, but I used rests. <laughs> so there were two critical things uh, to learn about Sipsi for me. One is that basically, and you probably noticed this in the example, he doesn't breathe well, or he's continuously circular breathing. Um, there are no phrases in the conventional way that a singer has to breathe um, or like an oboe player would need to breathe. So the only thing that actually defines the rhythm is also these leaps, these ornaments. Well, whatever kind of ornaments they are, whether downwards or most frequently upwards, like we heard, these are what are defining the rhythm, not the ends of notes or any rests. And I'd written lots of rests. And also Macomb musicians don't like counting rests. Um, but, but this is really important for Sipsi because they don't play rest. What, what can you do to, with a rest? Um, <laughs> and then the second thing is the diatonic nature of the instrument. So, and this is very much in the Husseini Macomb 
type of sense in the folk in folk music they call it the onamakam or sort of the the most central or basic makam of Anatolia. Um, that's what his finger holes are meant to play. And I'll just go ahead and show you what that looks like. These are the basic holes and the notes you get out of them. Of course, it's transposable depending on sipsy size. But, um, and it's from the subtonic G to A and up around a fifth. And then up above here, there's no, there are no holes anymore and it's all with embouchure. So here's Ferhat playing, I hope I have time for a tiny bit of this. Um, here, here's a piece with an E flat in it, which is a chromatic note that's difficult. And it's an arabesque tune that's popular and he obviously doesn't like playing it very much. Oop. Sorry, I'm, my PowerPoint is really acting up, but Okay, so you get the idea. He has to move his entire head to play this in half hole and all of these things. And you get a darker sound and it's just not a pleasing tone to the Sipsi player and it drives them mad, <laughs> basically. Um, here's a, well, okay, I think I'll skip over this example because what you've been hearing has been Anatolian folk mode Husseini, just so that we make sure we don't go uh, over. Here's the upper register. Um, where there are no finger holes and he demonstrates how completely with embouchure and some hand help he's able to navigate these. Okay, so it was a real mistake for me to write a leap to a G-sharp right in the middle of this glissando boge or region. Um, so to come back to, to my work directly, um, I feel like I'm pretty far along with the jura and with the finger tapping and you see some uh, excerpts from my developing score on this piece that use these but I still have a ways to go with Sipsi, but at least now, of course it helps to write a book about it because then you have to try to answer all the questions. And the book has led me on Sipsi and the interviews with Ferhat um, have led me to a new perspective really. Um, but what's so important about such basic things is, is that they give me a, a fundamentally different way of approaching the, the Anatolian wind instruments. And it replies again to Zurna, May, Balaban, Tulum, and uh, most of the wind instruments from Turkey. Um, so the perspective shift is critical to this process of trans traditional music making. And I don't think it would be possible unless we tried things out together and we actually worked on them. If I hadn't made these, um, some of them very quickly written. <laughs> I, I remember being encouraged by a Hazafin member, oh, you haven't written? Why don't you just write it tonight? Um, but then we try it, and, and this is what comes out of it, really valuable things. So it raises some questions for composers now. Um, I feel like 20th, 21st century composition along these lines is very different from 20th century. Back in the Bartok and, well, 19th century days of Dvorak, Smetna, Janacek, and so on. And that we need to go beyond this kind of appropriation. Uh, which already is a kind of hot topic these days, as we know. And how can a composer be more tuned in, more ethical, perhaps have a higher standard of ethics than previously? Um, and this goes back, I think, to collaboration, not accepting generalizations 
and also working with our ethnomusicologist friends who are doing such great work. Uh, because I wouldn't want to become like uh, Shirin, Robbie, and I gave a conference called Trans Traditional Istanbul, where a Chinese person gave a paper talking about composers who had used a completely maladapted folk song as representative of a region of China. So I wouldn't want to be one of those composers. That's quite embarrassing. I mean, what can you do? You were given it by a musicologist, but if the musicologist hasn't done their work well, then um, what is happening there? So I'll, I'll stop there with questions, and um, we invite questions both for Shirin and myself. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. We can have questions, yes, if there are any. Yes, Alessandra. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. It was very, very, very, very inspiring. And it, there was a lot to, to think about and to research. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask out of curiosity, because I, I know very little about Turkish music and music of the Mediterranean area, but um, you, were, you were actually conducting your music and I was, uh, guess, I was thinking if uh, that was because of a modern approach to the traditional music or there's a sort of uh, conduction figure in traditional music in, in the Turkish area as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's out of habit that I'm conducting it because I would do that in my group. And um, as someone who was basically trained in the Western way. Um, but it's a really good question because one of the real challenges for traditional music musicians is to follow a conductor. Um, and it's not always the best way. In fact, we've had other methods in past concerts where someone taps the player on the knee when they're supposed to come in and things like that, even when a conductor is present. Um, so it would, of course, be great to get rid of the conductor. But on the other hand, the Western musicians are relying on it. And there's no level of orality or remembering the music possible. So um, yeah, so we're approaching that, but sort of with caution, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if there's nobody else, I'm going to go again. <laughs> Um, there was this in, in the slide where you, where you talked about the, the woman throat playing. Uh, there was the name of there was a name which was Dudu Gok or something like that. Was that the name of the song she was yeah, playing? It was the name of the woman. Woman. Oh, okay, okay. And there is like a, a name of the song she was playing, or was it was she improvising? Uh, I think it was an improvisation. It was a song that she already knew, uh, and these songs are, as I said, played on the mountains while herding the uh, animals. Because it, it uh, reminded me a lot of traditional Sardinian music. There are a couple of melodies uh, that the women usually sing. Uh, and I was curious if I, if I could research a little bit about that because it was very interesting. But I'm, I'm, I'm guessing if I search for throat singing, maybe I'm going to find. Yeah, you can find some sources on YouTube. There are researchers who collect and record and publish them on YouTube. Uh, there are some examples, but it's not so widespread anymore. So it's not very vivid. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's a really fantastic CD, which I think might have that piece on it, um, which is, um, it's on the Kalan label, which is a great source for archival recordings. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the exact title, in my head, but it's called something like this, and I'm sure it will come up if you search for that. It's it, also the liner notes are fantastic about the throat singing technique. Mm -hmm. on this it's the product of a doctoral thesis. 
Maiden 9 Eylül University in İzmir. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, Argun, you're here. Hello. <laughs> it's so great to see everyone from. And thank you very much, Michael and Shirin. This was amazing. I mean, I know your work and the extensive, you know, field work that you go through. And I, I hope that your book will be released soon and this will be an amazing. So the question of having the notation, the transcriptions is really something that I mean we should maybe later talk on I mean it's a really broad sub subject I mean maybe maybe a small question I don't know maybe not a question but also I was you know in my thesis I was trying to transcribe Tamburi Cemil Bey's Michael knows probably Tamburi Cemil Bey's violoncello taksims and I felt really um, you know it was really difficult to put them on notation. So while you were kind of, I, I saw your transcriptions, they are fantastic, but also it is still really difficult for me to follow. <laughs> what what do you think about that? I mean... Yeah, actually I meant to warn on the Cheki Chali it was going to go by really fast <laughs> because, uh, of the, okay. because of the note values. Um, but it's true. Um, I think what I'm gravitating towards also, and this is partially with the influence of Murat Gurel, who we've been working with, who's, who wrote a thesis on ornamentation in, in Makam music, um, is that Western notation doesn't separate the two very well. And um, <laughs> my sense of it is that, and it, this is especially true in toxims and free things, that you have this kind of gestalt in the melody and you can move the rhythm around and stuff um, so there's this basic shape um, that's there and then the player is extemporizing all kinds of the rich repertoire of of what we call ornamentation i'm also arguing in the book we shouldn't really call it ornamentation because it's an essential part of the music it's of Macaulay. part of the structure yeah, yeah that's yeah, true and, and the sound yeah. And also timbre changes and you know sound changes, which are so important and which are ignored by a Western approach to notation. So I think it's very good to try to tease out ways of of either allowing ornamentation to be done by the player if they have the experience. And that's a big. I mean, <laughs> in my the boss part. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's a big question for me that still remains. Mm -hmm. old. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there is a solution and when we're navigating between orality and notation yes. and one side just demands detail and one side almost would prefer there not be so you have some freedom. But thanks to you, I mean, it's a really good work. I mean, to like for everybody else who doesn't know about this culture. Thank you very much, Michael and Shirin. And Teşek, yes, Teşek. I think we are finishing. We are at the end of the webinar. Thank you all for coming and listening to us. Uh, I need to announce that uh, by the end of this week, you will get a link to access the replay of this webinar during three weeks. And the second session of MOA, Medina on Air, is scheduled in December 2022. And you can follow Medinia on social networks to know when you can subscribe. Thank you all for coming and listening to us again. Thank you, everyone, to a great project. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.